L-E-L-A, with Michael Steinberg and Associates, who represents the plaintiffs. Michael Steinberg, that's S-T-E-I-N-B-E-R-G. For the purposes of this, uh, it's Miguel Steinberg. It's Michael Steinberg. <laughs> and Maria? Maria Asuncion Lopez. Asuncion, I know this is wrong. A-S-U-N-C-I-O-N. Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z. And Pres you know the President of the Hispanic Alliance of Tampa Bay and uh, Director of Latino Professionals Network. And my name is Victor Rudy, R-U-D-Y, last name is DeMaio, it's capital D, little I, capital M-A-I-O. And uh, I'm co-chairman of the Hillsboro Hispanic Coalition, one of the plaintiffs in the, in the suit, which is a nonpartisan organization. So, Michael? Well, what, what I'm going to do for now is uh, give a little bit of a history of the presidential um, primary process. I'm sure that most of you will know the history, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Back in 1968, uh, the, the, the Democratic um, National Convention, Hubert Humphrey won the nomination, although he did not have to go through a presidential primary preference process like we do now. The, the candidate was selected by the elite uh, members of the Democratic National Committee, and there was a lot of backlash from that, and so they decided and instead of having the states have a beauty contest where the uh, states would just recommend who they would like for the uh, presidential nomination, that the states would get to vote, either have caucuses or, or actual elections, and that the voters would actually get a say-so in who was the nominee for president for each major political party. <coughs> um, since that time, Iowa and New Hampshire have been first and second in the uh, uh, process, Iowa, the first caucus in New Hampshire, uh, the first uh, presidential primary. Uh, as time went on, uh, people began to notice that Iowa and New Hampshire had very few black or Hispanics in their uh, voting electorate. Uh, in 2004, the Democratic National Committee, uh, prompted by a Harvard Law Review article that, uh, that it's a possibility that by scheduling Iowa and New Hampshire always first could be a violation of the Voting Rights Act, decided to add Nevada and South Carolina to the early tier uh, of the uh, presidential preference primary. So those four states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, would get to go first before all the other states. And if a state such as Florida decided that they were going to schedule their primary uh, earlier than what was allowed, they would be penalized. So four years ago, in 2008, uh, Victor DeMaio, who's to my right, and I decided to challenge the decision of the Democratic National Committee to uh, eliminate the uh, delegates from the state of Florida for, for having their presidential preference primary uh, in January uh, before uh, they were allowed to by DNC rules. Uh, we were not successful in that lawsuit. And, um, one of the reasons was is that um, Victor was not part of a, a, a class of citizens that was protected under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution or the uh, uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, this time around, um, uh, we had discussed this months ago uh, about the fact that uh, Nevada, even though uh, they have a large percentage of Hispanics in the state of Nevada, only 18% of the of Hispanics who registered vote in Nevada were Republicans. If you added all the registered Republicans in New Hampshire, South Carolina, um, Iowa, and Nevada, it's less than 3% of the registered voters in those four states. And yet nationally, over 9.5% or about 9.5% of the registered voters are Hispanic. So there's a disproportionate share of, uh, or, or a inverse disproportionate share of Hispanic voters to the voters of those four states versus the national numbers. And we feel that the disproportionately uh, lack of representation of Hispanics uh, is a violation of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution as well as the, uh, the Voting Rights Act. So uh, uh, there's a, a group, uh, the Hispanic uh, 
Hillsborough Hispanic Coalition, which is a bipartisan, nonpartisan group uh, consisting of members who are Republican, Democrat, and Independent, uh, as well as uh, an individual who have filed this, uh, this lawsuit uh, against the Republican National Committee, but it might as well have been against both parties because the Democratic National Committee has the same rules. The only reason it wasn't brought against the Democratic National Committee is because there was not a contested primary. So this is not a partisan complaint. It's a complaint about the system discriminating against Hispanic Americans. Um, so we brought the lawsuit, uh, and our goal is to try to convince the courts that um, we need to have uh, uh, a, a similarity in the early voting states uh, with respect to Hispanic voters to uh, the all registered voters as there are national there's nine percent of Hispanics um, who are registered to vote nationally. It should be about nine percent in the early voting states. Um, Eight percent, nine and a half percent, ten percent, somewhere in that neighborhood. But three percent versus nine and a half percent is unreasonable. And we can see in this election alone uh, how the candidates uh, in their debates and their and their platforms were either not discussing the issues that were important to Hispanics or were actually uh, antagonistic to Hispanics until they got to Florida and all of a sudden the message changes and they're backtracking. And that's how important Florida is. And yet Florida is going to lose 50% of its delegates to the Republican National Convention because they wanted to go uh, in the early tier. Uh, so that's that's why we're here today is to, to explain that, uh, uh, that this is not a partisan issue. It's a, uh, it's a fairness issue, it's an equal protection issue, and it, it's not just Hispanics, but also African Americans are in the same boat. But, but for, this, for this particular lawsuit, we're we'll bringing it on behalf of Hispanic Americans. And I want to go ahead and ask uh, Maria if she wants to say a few words as well. I'd like to... Um... Oh, one, one second, you move my school so I can get the... Oh, okay. Can you do it in English as well? No, okay. You know, you can do it in English. Uh, first, I need to see what's going on with my microphone. I've been getting all that, getting all that natural. I was going to do mine in Spanish. But it's the same message. So. Uh, I'll give one little statement, and then we can take questions. Is that okay for me? All right, since we're here, I'm here. Um, as everybody knows, I, I filed a lawsuit with, with the uh, help of Michael Steinberg four years ago against the Democratic National Committee uh, when the rules were that if you vote early, like we're doing today, uh, in the Democratic side of the fence, you would lose all your delegates. Uh, it was said after the election was over, last time, and in a kind of a post-mortem analysis of the election, 
that if my lawsuit had won, that Hillary Clinton would be president of the United States today. Uh, it's, it's, it's not right for uh, me as a Florida voter, and I want to stress too that this group that I'm co-chairman of, the Hillsborough Hispanic Coalition, is 100% nonpartisan. We have Republicans, Democrats, and Independents in our group. Uh, we, we, we initially formed our group to uh, go through the redistricting process, which is going on now in Hillsborough County, to fight for Hispanic districts and fight for Hispanic districts throughout the state of Florida. Um, but we, we feel as a group, and also last uh, Wednesday, uh, we presented our intentions to the group called LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. It's an 80 year old organization with a million man members nationwide, also a nonpartisan group. They agreed 100% to support us in our, in our, in our cause. So um, the, it's not right that the Democrats took away 100% of our delegates. And it's not right that Republicans have to suffer the loss of 50% or 50 delegates out of 100 that they deserve. It makes Florida the size of a much smaller state. So we're fighting for the rights of all citizens, all voters, regardless of uh, your party affiliation. And that's one of the things I wanted to stress uh, more than anything else, is that even though we're, we're arguing for this issue today, the Democrats have the same exact rules. And it happened four years ago. It's happening today in today's election as a result. And guess what? If you don't do this four years from now, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Florida's going to get stuck again losing their delegates. So we have to, we're here to put a stop uh, to the madness. So that's what I wanted to say. And I'll move the microphone back over to Michael if anybody wants to ask questions. I'm sorry. I'm just going to. Okay. Let me see. Buenas tardes. Ayer mis clientes, la coalición hispano del condado de Hillsborough, tanto como Ralph y Manueli, registraron una demanda en el corte federal en Tampa, peleando la violación de la ley de derechos electorales bajo la constitución de los Estados Unidos. Realmente es una lucha para los derechos de la comunidad hispana nacional. Básima, básicamente el problema es que el horario de la primaria enfoca primero en los estados de Iowa, New Hampshire y South Carolina. Estos estados tienen poco más de un por ciento de votantes hispanos elegibles en comparación del 9% nacional y 13.5% aquí en Florida. El resultado es que el sistema hoy en día se le limite la influencia de la voz de los votantes hispanos. Porque la voz de los hispanos llega a los líderes del partido demasiado tarde, la resulta es una voz silenciada políticamente y se debilita el poder de los votantes hispanos en los Estados Unidos. No importa si la motiva sea deliberada o coincidente, la resulta es inconstitucional porque se viola los derechos de los votantes hispanos. Los estados de Iowa, New Hampshire y South Carolina no representan una parte proporcional de los votantes hispanos. Y es peor que, ya que llega el momento de la primaria aquí en Florida, el Partido Republicano y también el Partido Demócrata, cuatro años atrás, los quitaron los delegados. Específicamente el Partido Republicano hoy en día nos están quitando 50% de los delegados, debilitando nuestra voz aún más. Es una adición de sal a la herida. Es importante notar que este es un asunto no partidista, porque los demócratas han hecho lo mismo contra los votantes hispanos en su partido. En el 2009 nuestra bufeta luchó para los derechos de los votantes hispanos en el Partido Demócrata, con una demanda contra el partido. Es hora de poner fin a esta injusticia. Muchísimas gracias por su atención a este asunto tan importante. Questions? What are you hoping to gain by this lawsuit? Okay. What we're hoping uh, is, is, is two things. We're asking the court to reinstate Florida's full, full delegation of 100 delegates. Uh, and 
if they won't do that, we're asking the court to order the Republican National Committee in the 2016 primary election to schedule their primaries in a way that Hispanics representation, uh, proportionate representation in the earlier states mirrors or closely mirrors the percentage of Hispanics nationally. Now, we're not asking for an exact figure like 9% and 9%, but somewhere close where Hispanic voters feel that they have a, um, that they're enfranchised like the rest of America in the political process. You said 9% nationwide, that's the... It's greater than 9% nationwide. Greater than 9%. It's close to 9.5%. The voting Hispanics. Right. That's, that's, that's less than the population. This is a registered vote. And by the way, Hispanics do not register to vote in, the, in, in its high percentages. It's not Hispanics, perhaps because they feel uh, um, under-enfranchised. What percentage are the um, Republican registered? Okay, and, and I don't know the exact figures in the bottom, uh, except that, that that the Pew Institute uh, has done a study, and they said 18% of Hispanics um, are registered as Republicans in the bottom. In Florida, it's close to 50-50 Republican and Democrat. Actually, it used to be more Republican than Democrat, but in recent years, it's it's a slightly more Democrat registration than uh, than. Um, Republicans, but there's a lot of independent Hispanic support as well. But nationally? Uh, nationally, uh, there's more Democrats than, than uh, Republicans, um, you know, registered Hispanics nationally. So it would be 9%? Um, I don't know the exact figure. But we're going to compare apples to apples. So the, the figure of 3% is considering, all, uh, 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 for those first four states, is considering uh, all registered voters. So if you only include the Hispanic uh, Republicans, then the figure is much smaller. So if the 9% is smaller, so is the registered Republican. So uh, it, it's, it's going to be a similar proportion. Your last lawsuit, um, what, and I just did a quick read before I came here, uh, suggest, uh, kind of made the opposite argument. It was a reverse discrimination argument that Hispanics and African Americans were overrepresented in some of the early primary states. No. It's, it's close. What we said is that race and national origin was should not be a consideration in the scheduling, and we were wrong. Actually, when I when I when I when we did the lawsuit, and I went back and reviewed it, and I looked at the numbers. I said, you know, I, it actually, uh, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done it similar to the way we're doing it now. But um, at the time, there were certain time constraints, and uh, and. Um, I, I made a, made a, a uh, judgmental error when I uh, prepared that lawsuit. Um, you know, the hindsight's 2020, but um, had I to do it all over again, I would have done it. So is that, you're saying that was that a strategic error or a, or, a, or just wrong um, argument? Wrong argument. Why wait until today to file, you know, yesterday to file today to announce it? Why not do this earlier? Issue over the to the, the, today's a good day to demonstrate how important the Hispanic vote is because Florida um, has 1.7 million registered Hispanic voters and it's, it's a huge number and let's just compare to uh, let's say uh, South Carolina with 36,000 Hispanic voters or New Hampshire with 14,900 Hispanic voters or Nevada with 200,000 Hispanic voters. There's more Hispanic voters in Florida than there are in the other four states combined by a, a great margin. And so uh, by uh, doing it today, and the fact that there's a primary election for today demonstrates how important the Hispanic vote is nationally. Can you clarify why you believe this lawsuit would succeed, whereas the one similar one four years ago did not? Sure. Um, th there was a similar lawsuit filed by, by uh, Senator Nelson and Alcee Hastings in Jacksonville. The district court, in their decision against Bill Nelson and Alcee Hastings, said that um, while that lawsuit failed, that there are there could be a circumstance where. Um, the uh, scheduling of the primaries would violate the uh, Voting Rights Act. And, and the court mentioned some of the earlier uh, cases uh, many years ago in Texas, the Democratic Party had a white-only primary. 
and the Supreme Court had made a decision that even though this was a political party, they were state actors for the purposes of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And they said a political party who worked in coordination with a state agency such as the Division of Elections could not discriminate based on, on race. And so the court in Jacksonville said that, that there are circumstances where a, a, a racial um, or language minority uh, could bring a successful action under the Voting Rights Act, but it just wasn't there in that particular case. So um, we, we believe there's a potential of being successful um, in, in, in using that route. Um, have, have the number of Hispanic women from Iowa, because you gave it to us for South Carolina? Uh, Iowa, it actually, um, it's gone up slightly since the, the statistics I have were from 2008, and there has been, there's been an increase. But um, um, this is from the Pew Hispanic Center. Um, about 40,000 Hispanic, and it was, it was about um, three, three and a half percent. I think it's up to close to five percent of the population of the state is Hispanic, but only about two percent or 1.7 percent back in 2008 were uh, registered voters. And you compare that to Hillsborough County alone, in Hillsborough County, out of 1.2 million people who live here, uh, almost 300,000 are Hispanic. So we have a lot, we have more Hispanic people in, in, in our county than in the entire state in, of Iowa. And those numbers grew by 71% in just 10 years from the last census. So you see how important it is. And it's been ironic that since the candidates have come to Florida all week long, all we've heard about is addressing issues relating to the Hispanic community. It's been nonstop on the news 24 hours a day. And, and I'll tell you, the mistake I made in the earlier lawsuit that I didn't realize is when I saw that, that Nevada had about 25% of its population is Hispanic, and, and they were one of the first four states, and the Democratic National Committee addressed the fact, and when, when they were having their meeting, and they decided on the first four states, they said, we're going to put in a state with a high percentage of African Americans and a state with a high percentage of Hispanics. And I thought, well, well, they took care of that because they have Nevada in the mix. However, looking at the total number of people in Nevada and the registered voters in Nevada that are Hispanic and the registered Republican Hispanic voters, and, 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 and if you add up all four states, it, it's still um, in combination as a very small percentage of the total registered voters in those four states. And had I done the research on the numbers back then, like I'm doing this time around, I think we would have um, been more successful. But it was, uh, you know, I, like I said, hindsight's 20, 20 and it's easy just to, uh, to second guess yourself. So we kind of had four years to prepare for this. And it's, it, you know, like Michael says, hindsight is always good to do, do the homework and research. So. Um, and again, this is nonpartisan. The Democrat rules and Republican rules are the same. You, you go out of line, you're going to get penalized. So um, again, this is not, uh, I don't want people to, to see this as a Democrat thing or Republican thing. This is for, this is for all the voters in Florida. So, and you know, you know, e even if the lawsuit is not successful, which I think there, there, there's a, there, this could go either way because the courts have not made a ruling on this particular issue, I think it's important to bring to the attention of the political parties that, that there is a perception of discrimination amongst the Hispanic community and that if they want the Hispanic vote, the Democrats want to keep it and the Republicans want to get it, they better pay attention to the Hispanic voters, uh, that, um, that they do feel underenfranchised and whether legally we can, we can force the parties to uh, make things equal uh, or fair, um, it's still something they should be concerned about. And just, la just last Friday, the Secretary of State of New Hampshire was here in Tampa speaking before the Tiger Bay Club, and I asked him this question, and I told him about what we had, were thinking of doing, and he actually addressed, he said, this particular legal issue has not really been addressed by the court. I mean, the parties get about $30 million of federal tax money to put on their conventions. Uh, they're not exactly a private club like they're saying they are. I mean, the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party both um, are, in, are completely integrated with the state system. As you can see today, by today's election, where we have all the polls open uh, throughout the state of Florida, 
and it's literally costing the taxpayers millions of dollars to put this on. So this is not a private club putting on a uh, social club election. This is for to decide who the next president of the United States may may be. So it's it's very they're very integrated. Can you give us kind of a timeline of what this process is going to be like? What we can expect? Sure. They they, they are required to expedite election cases, and uh, we're probably looking at about. 60 days before a district court makes a decision. If the district court decision is not favorable, uh, maybe a month before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals makes a decision, and so maybe three to four months, so it's uh, June, July, probably we will get a decision. We may not get a decision before the convention, but um, this, this type of lawsuit would apply to future elections, so even if we don't get a decision before the primary election before the, uh, the convention, um, we're hoping that, that it will apply to 2016, 2020, and, and, and thereafter. I'm going to go back to a question that was asked before. If there's a chance that this isn't going to apply to the Republican National Convention in August, again, why not start this process sooner? Was the potential reward for waiting so great that it outweighed potentially not having an outcome prior to RNC? Well, it, it really, the, the lawsuit would have to make a difference. If, if uh, for instance, right now, if, if Romney were the only one left standing, like Obama's the only one left standing, it really wouldn't make a difference. There's a possibility, not a probability, but a possibility that we could have a brokerage convention that Romney or Gingrich may be 50 votes short of securing the nomination. And, and if that's the case, then I think the district court and the 11th Circuit will give a, a full written opinion on the law rather than uh, sometimes what the courts will do is they'll give a short opinion. They call it per curiam affirmed, but a, a, a decision without a lengthy explanation. So uh, what we're hoping for is that it's a close enough primary uh, like it is now that the 11th Circuit will uh, give a detailed explanation as to why they're ruling the way they so it could make a difference in this primary election if we can get it heard before August. And just to clarify, you said you want to get the full delegates for this election, but if not, then you're looking for future. But if you do get the full delegates, then that would, that would have repercussions for future elections, wouldn't it, automatically? In other words, yes. if, if no, you well, get your delegates reinstated for this election, then it would automatically have they would have to rule that, that the uh, process violates the Voting Rights Act or the 14th Amendment to the Constitution to give the full uh, number of delegates to Florida. We agree that the political parties, uh, absent a violation of the Voting Rights Act or the uh, Constitution, can schedule their primaries any way they want, and they can penalize the states for going outside the, the calendar. We don't have a problem with them saying six states go first, Another six states go second, another six states go third, and if you violate the schedule, you lose delegates. We have a problem with them saying uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, you go first because you don't have a lot of Hispanics and blacks in your, um, in your electorate, and all the other states have to go after you so that we already know who the nominee is going to be after the first six primaries. That's the problem we have. 